if you've got a filter that's, you know, fairly small versus the blue wrap that, you know, can be 54s, all of a sudden now your waste footprint is significantly reduced. Rising above the buzz of ultrasonic cleaners and the clanking of stainless steel are the ideas and voices that are changing an industry. You're listening to the Beyond Clean podcast, the central nexus for the people, processes, and products that are improving our sterile processing world. Each week, we speak with frontline technicians, CEOs, engineers, and entrepreneurs with a common goal to help you fight dirty. Every instrument, every time. Whether you're tuning in for education or inspiration, we're glad you did. Now, turn on those washers and turn up the volume. It's time to go beyond clean. On this Vendor Spotlight, we speak with Mike Strand, Regional Sales Director, Northwest Healthcare Solutions for Asculap. And Mike has been in the business for quite a while. I'll let him tell his story. But one thing that stands out is how much he loves to educate. And this episode is chock full of knowledge and information. And we are going to be focusing on Asculap's new container system called the Icon Container System. So we're going to get right into it with Mike Strand. We'll be back after a short break. From 17 Studios, you're listening to Beyond Clean, the global voice of sterile processing. Joining us now is Michael Strand, Regional Sales Director of the Northwest Healthcare Solutions at Asculap. And today we're going to be talking about containers. And this is a series of podcasts that we've done with Asculap this year. This is the third in the series. We've already talked about education and we've talked about instrument repair. And not surprisingly, both of those topics still overlap quite well with the discussion we're going to have today with Mike. So Mike, really happy to have you on the show. Thanks for joining me. Justin, thanks for having me. This is exciting for me. It's always fun to talk to you guys, and and I think it's going to be a great discussion. I'll tell you, one of the things that I really like about this job, (laughs) it's a job, but I kind of put it in quotes. I love doing this, and one of the things I love about it is I get to meet people, and I get to learn about their experiences and their background and what kind of makes them unique. And we always do a call ahead of the call to just kind of talk about things, and As I got to know you, just your extensive experience, but also how much you really care about what you do, really shined through to me. And so I want you to, I want to go ahead and, and, you know, kind of take the cover off and say, you've got 30 years of experience in this industry. (laughs) I mean, we could almost do a podcast, you know, just on how involved you've been in driving, you know, sterile processing and safe surgery forward. But I thought maybe you could give us a, a little bit of your background and really the why that you've done this for the better part of your entire professional life. Well, it's interesting. When I got out of college, I was looking for a sales position and, you know, and I had some and, but when I found medical, I think the thing that I found was that always resonated with me was it was high tech, but it was also high touch. So it was really important for me to connect with people and, and, and have customers for the long term, because I'm sort of that long term kind of person. And, and I like those relationships and I like building things with customers. And, and, you know, if they had issues or problems and maybe we had some solutions or some thoughts or ideas or even references to other customers that were going through similar things to me, that just, that just lit me up. And, and so. I think early on, you know, I actually started my career back in 1984 in the medical device business with, with V. Mueller and spent seven years with them and then the last 31 with, with Esculap and, and really have found a home just in, in terms of the company culture and I think the products, but also the way we, the way we work with our customers is really about partnering and connecting at, at a level besides transactional, right? We can sell them stuff all day long, 
but can we sell things that that mean something to them, that resonate, that solve problems, that make things faster, better, smoother, that take care of the patient better. That kind of thing really resonated with me. And so for me, I found a home and, and goodness, why leave when, when it works, right? Yeah. Well, and that educational piece, just making yourself a resource. So critical. Oh, It is. And it's very much in alignment with, you know, kind of our vision for Beyond Clean was to bring free education And, you know, I'm certain that you volunteered countless hours of time over the years to provide education as well. Yeah. And I remember, you know, even way back in the day, you know, I I was invited a number of times to teach it at local classes or, you know, the, the local surgical tech or SPD tech schools, you know, and just provide them some input on instrumentation. So, you know, you hang around the business long enough and you pick up some things and, and you learn some things. And, you know, if you're, if, if you're willing enough, you can share some of that knowledge. And, you know, as, as I'm more towards the back end of my career than I am at the front, to me, that, that sharing of knowledge, that, education piece but helping teach and that's that's it's just, it's just one of the best things still and even now with my own company i get asked to come back and teach the sales training classes for the new the new people which that's really fun right because they don't know anything right <laughs> and then then teaching it's, is the intrinsic reward exactly and you could you can get them going down the right path so we've been talking about ask lap on this series quite a bit and Really, the focus is helping hospitals operate with greater precision. And we're going to put that into the context of sterilization containers today. But I thought we could start by all of these high-tech, high-touch points, right? Like you said that Mm -hmm. right off of the bat. And with all of these high-touch points, meaning all the contact that you have with sterile processing technicians and supervisors, managers, directors, and maybe even their counterparts in the operating room as you're walking through this whole process, what are some of the things that you're noticing, maybe some emerging trends that, you know, really help you be in alignment with that mission to help hospitals operate with greater precision? Justin, it's a a great question. And, And, you know, if you've been around a while, you've seen the evolution of this business, right? I mean, 10, 15 years ago, a, a conversation like this was unheard of, right? Because oftentimes sterile processing was, you know, they, they were that, you know, big dishwasher place down in the basement, right? And nobody looked at them and, and unless there was a problem. But think about what's happened recently, you know, over the years. I mean, the the focus on sterile processing, not in a bad way, but but just the sort of the sophistication, the professionalism, the development. I mean, it's grown ex- exponentially. So, you know, we've got a lot of different sources. You got not only JCO, but DMV, you got Department of Health, you've got OSHA, Medicare, Medicaid. They now are looking at sterile processing in a way that, that they never had before. So has sterile processing grown with that? scrutiny. And it absolutely has. I mean, the vendor IFUs, the, the focus on the IFUs has been a really, really big thing. ARN, Amy, those advanced directives, the professional organization, you know, formerly Isham and, and, and now HSP, and even beyond clean. This wasn't going to happen 10 years ago, right? But but it is now because it needs to. So this, this department within the hospital is so critical even to the point where there are advanced certifications within this group, right? And so that professionalism has grown, like I said, you know, tenfold. Now, as a company, how do we connect with that? And that's really an important piece. You know, the CEU credits that our, our sales reps can deliver so that people can keep up on their, on their licensing, very important for that, but also can I teach something? Can I educate something? Can I help you in your daily business? Really important. And I think that one of the biggest changes that's happened over the last few years is how much more sterile processing has become a business, right? We're treating it like a business. We're not just washing stuff. We're not just running them through the sterilizer and, and, and doing those important things that we need to do to make sure that we've got a a sterile product. But the hospitals are looking at 
still processing as a functioning business unit. Now, what does that mean for vendors, not just SCAP, but all the vendors? It means that we are getting audiences with periop directors, director of nursing, sometimes COO, CFOs, because now sterile processing is a component, is a cog in solutions, right? Can I be faster, more efficient? Can I be better? Can I be more modernized and not bog down the business of surgery? So those are some of the biggest things that have changed over the year. And, and as, as a company, we have to respond to that. And I think we've done that well to make sure that the audience that we're talking to resonates. Yeah, I'll tell you, you're absolutely correct. We're on a totally new trajectory. And I think even those leaders that you're talking about outside of the sterile processing department are expecting another level of strategic understandings. And it's put a lot of strain on the departments that are traditionally understaffed and then as the staffing model started to adjust, there was still sort of a shortage. And then obviously what's been happening over the last several years, sure. I mean, this is one of the biggest issues that's kind of been going on. And I think what the industry needs and wants to see from their vendor partners is that little extra because they need it. If they're always understaffed, you know, how do we make things go and how do they get the leadership training and all of that. And it does start with knowledge and education, but it also talks about partnership. And so, you know, as we talk about how you and your team and everybody else and all the other areas that we've talked about with Askulap, how do you come to the table and bring that partnership and that extra so that we can really tackle this challenge? Because you're right, more scrutiny, less available staff. That's a, quite a strain on, as you mentioned, on a profession that's getting a lot more sophisticated and those eyes that are on it. It used to be a surveyor might come in and just take a quick breeze through the department, but they were intimidated because they didn't know anything. Well, now everybody Not else now. is learning. <laughs> so they care more, but they also are knowing enough yeah. to be dangerous and maybe even more dangerous in some ways, but it's to the benefit of the industry. It just is a painful transition for a lot of the people working on the front lines at times. And so I kind of want to walk this back because this is a very sure. high level kind of discussion, but we're going to be talking specifically about containers. And so I want to go back to the beginning on that story. Like okay. when did Asculap bring this container solution to the market? How has it evolved over the years? Give me the story of containers. Well, I, I suppose it could probably go back to the to the late 1800s if you really want to go back that far, Justin. You know, the the original containers were were made to get clean, usable instruments to to a battlefield. So that's what a container was really developed for. Now, as as things developed, they realized that they could heat them up, they could cook them, they could you know uh, kill the bugs and and present them in a more aseptic manner. That that product sort of developed, but it developed in Europe. And Esculap was the leader there and brought sterile containers to the U.S. at the AORN 1979. So, you know, in terms of history, I mean, 40 some years ago, seems like a long time, but really not that long. The original containers that they brought over were, were very different than what we have now just in terms of functionality. They had a little little key and a little lock and a latch. And if you lost the key, oh my God, what do we do? You know, so but that product evolved really quickly because the US market latched onto a container very quickly. And so it in fact a number of competitive containers jumped in in the very early 80s really quickly. And some of them were good, some of them, you know, not. And the ones that weren't didn't last very long because, you know, things like sterile efficacy are, are sort of important, Justin. So, you know, we, we had to have a good container and you could see the, the evolution of the product. And there were a couple of iterations that SQLAP came out with. The latest one was what we call the Sterile Container 2000, you know, sort of this modernized name that, that we bandied about in, in the late 1990s. So the existing container, what we call our legacy container, has been around for almost 25 years now. I mean, it's a workhorse and it could still keep going because its features, its benefits, it, you know, all the things that it delivers is still very viable and relevant. There's a new container that Esculap has developed. It's called the Icon, A-I-C-O-N, 
Esculap Intelligent Container, I guess is the acronym. But it's been in Europe for a year and a half or so. It was at the World Congress, I think two years ago was when it first rolled out. Europe can get things to the market sometimes a little quicker. They don't have the FDA. But to our advantage, they released the product in Europe. It's done very well. And they could see, you know, because it's brand new, they could figure out, okay, what do we need to do here in the U.S. on our submission to the FDA? We've got submission to the FDA. It's approved for steam both with and without dry time. And we're working on other modalities as well. So the new container has got some interesting features and ones that we, we assume and, and trust that this container will be the one that's going to take us for the next 25 years because the market is changing. So we've changed the container to sort of match not just today, but what we see five, six, 10 years down the road are going to be some of the more critical components of, of that kind of product. So I want to run down some of those details here in a minute, but let's just talk about where the sterile containers have an impact, right? Like what's the benefits? I mean, there are some facilities out there that are still, you know, almost strictly blue wrap. And then there are some facilities that already have containers. And I think people have a general idea of where, you know, this sterilization method winds up impacting, you know, the operation. But I just want to make sure, because we have people from all varying levels of experience. If you were to just really summarize what areas do sterile containers kind of have an impact for, for the hospitals? Just for a lot of our products, for most of our products, we, we look at a, a number of areas, you know, patient outcomes is always at the top of the list, right? That's an important one. Is there sustainability? That's critical. And when, when you say sustainability, I want to define that really quickly. I, I'm assuming that when you say sustainability, you're talking about eco-friendly, environmentally conscious, green initiatives that hospitals have been placing a much greater focus on day to day. Absolutely. I, I think with that, and, and sustainability can be a broad topic, but for us in containers, we, we think of it in, in terms of a smaller waste footprint of containers over wraps, particularly, you know, reduces landfill space and cost of disposal is, is terrifically reduced. So that's kind of what we're thinking, because if, if you've got a filter that's, you know, fairly small versus the blue wrap that, you know, can be 54s, all of a sudden now your waste footprint is significantly reduced. So, Mike, one of the things we just talked about in sort of this bigger picture is the staffing crisis. And departments being required to be more sophisticated and more strategic and kind of moving up in terms of where they sit in the organization, which is really good. But at the same time, we still have these people that have to be able to do the job and get the equipment cleaned and sterilized and up to the OR. And so we're really just squeezing every last drop of efficiency these days. I mean, we're all looking for it because we can't just continue to throw bodies at a situation to increase output. We have to get it from more of these lean concepts. So can you talk to me about operational efficiencies related to containers? And then I, I'm really excited to go through some of the new features. So I, oh, I want to dive into good. that too. Yeah, I, no, I think you're, you're setting the right stage though. Let's talk about why, you know, one of the big whys of containers is, is that operational efficiency. So when we think of operational efficiency in relation to containers, we're thinking of, enhanced throughputs, right? So if if SPDs are asked to do more with less or do more with the same or are really challenged with staffing as, as so many are right now, how can you make the process faster, smoother, more consistent, more reliable, more of the same every time? And, and containers can help do that. And it, while it connects very strongly to the cost component, as well, the throughput really is is the key. That's that's sort of the magic button right there. Is is can I get more stuff done in a block of eight hours for my staff, for my OR, for my patients? And that becomes really critical 
in, especially post COVID when people are trying to get this figured out and the OR is, is running at 110% capacity pre pandemic and SPD has no more resources. How do we do that? Containers can be a critical component in that. If one, if there's a lot of blue wrap, because that takes a lot of time, right? And number two, if you have a mixed fleet of, of old and aging containers, maybe you've got some Genesis, maybe you've got some Escalate, maybe you've got some Case, but consolidating that to one makes it easier for your staff, right? Now everything is the same. Everything is consistent. When I go to work in the morning, I know I'm going to put this filter in that container and I'm going to latch it down with that lock and away we go. So there's other ways besides just Blue Wrap to say, can we make things more efficient just in the scope of how you're going about your daily business? Okay, so let's start talking about the containers and specifically the icon because there's some technology that's built into here that I really do want to talk greatly about. But first, let's talk about application. What are the applications of the container? Like, can it do all the various modalities of sterilization, including immediate use? What's the application of these containers? Yeah, right now, the FDA validations are for steam and it's steam with dry time and it's also steam without dry time. So IUSS, yes, standard steam, yes, and low temp, we've we've made some submissions to the FDA. Now, you know as well as I do that I couldn't give you a date. I can't even tell you if they're going to approve it, right? So low temp is down the road. So let's let's hang tight on that. It's not it's not here yet. But some of the exciting things around the steam thing, particularly if if people are, are challenged with extended dry times, there's there's some opportunities to get dry times more in line with with IFUs. Many IFUs for instruments twenty minutes, many IFUs for vendor trays thirty minutes, but we find a lot of SPDs that are are out 45, 50 minutes on their dry times. Right? What if we what if we could pull you back to the point where you could be in line with that IFU? And if you could save 20 minutes on your dry times on your vendor trays, what does that do to your throughput? What does that do to your operational efficiency? Now we're back to where we were talking before, right? Now we've got some, I think, some deliverables on a day-to-day basis that can you quantify it by, by dollars and cents today? No, but you could probably look at it in terms of productivity over a, over a span of six, 12 months and see some really solid improvements. Remember, we talked about running this as a business. Things like productivity models are out there, particularly with tracking systems and stuff. You can, you can see how I'm doing. We can see how we're doing. So I think that anything that we can do to help make it faster, smoother, better, and certainly dry times is, is a critical component of that. Well, so you have a history of a very quality product here, but then, as you mentioned, you launched the icon. So you're making some improvements there. I want to walk through that. What What are some of the things that are new and innovative about the icon container system? Yeah, uh, well, I think one thing too is well, well, we're we're very German, and and you know, as as a company, you know, very high quality, very focused on on the product portfolio that that we do so well with. Escalab also is constantly innovating, and and we've been thinking about a new container for for some time, and and the design that Escalab Germany has come up with is is very exciting. One of the things that will impact the OR, and they will really like, is what we call an expanded sterile aseptic area. So a standard container sort of comes up at a, at a, a vertical level and the, and the lid latches down on it. The new icon sort of folds that top part of the container bottom over. So now if somebody with a gown on it and, and, and gloves is reaching into the container and their gown touches the side of the container, that that sterile piece will prevent their glove from, from contaminating. So it has increased the sterile aseptic area. Really a big deal in the operating room, particularly if you've got vendor trays or you've got multi-layer trays in a deep container where the scrub tech has to reaching in. Exactly. So 
So that's a big deal. And, and the people in the OR seem to like that said, Oh, that's going to help us a lot. I don't have to worry. Gosh, did I touch that? Do I have to, you know, break the room and that kind of thing? So, you know, or destroy my back table because I may have contaminated. So we, we like that, that expanded sterile aseptic space. So what I'm also really interested in as I kind of looked over some information was the QR code. And I know it there's one cool. purpose for that, but having worked in service before and even coming off our interview with Pavel and talking about repair, I love having a good handle on inventory. And I think the QR code, like one of the things that will happen when you print a label from a tracking system is sometimes that label gets printed twice. And so then you have duplicate trays. And even as you're trying to run a preventive maintenance model, nothing presents a challenge more to your instrument repair partner than having two trays that are indexed the same because it looks like you serviced the tray, but you didn't. This unique QR code, I think, has some pretty substantial implications. And I know you're probably not even thinking about that, but it's the first thing I thought of when I saw the <laughs> containers had a QR code on them, that unique identifier that won't leave the container. I absolutely love that. But what are some of the other applications of the QR code? Well, the application right now is if you if you scan the QR code with your phone, the RIFU will pop up. So that's kind of cool, right? So I know a lot of people use one source and 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 have repositories for their their IFUs, which is terrific, and you should. But if you ever needed to see something, you could scan it, and there's the IFU, and you could you could take a peek at it. So the thing about a QR code is that it's it's just a holding place for information, right? And I think that um, it's part of that thought of what's our industry going to need five years, 10 years down the road now. So, so our, our parent company in, in uh, Esculap, Germany, sort of thought of that. And, you know, there are times when maybe our industry and, and the, you know, let me, let me go back just a sec. So there are times when the opportunity for storing information will be really critical. Technology will catch up to this at some point, right? Technology is moving very fast, particularly around storing data. And if we've already got the QR code built in, we may be able to partner and start to load specific data that the customer needs, whether it's the the item number, you know, when was the last time it was serviced, that type of thing. I don't know what that's going to look like right now, but the QR code is there and let's see where the industry takes it, where it wants to go, and what kind of technology develops where we can utilize that in five years. So let's talk about operational efficiency again. How many filters does this container use? Um, can you count to one? So <laughs> it's <Fantastic>. in there. <laughs> that's a time you know, that, right that's there. Kind of, yeah, and and over over a a number of years, it's a cost saver, right? Little filters aren't very expensive, but if you're using a million of them over 10 years, all of a sudden now it's there's a bunch of them, right? So yeah, there's one filter. It's actually shaped like an hourglass and it's in the lid. And um, it's, um, it's, it's a cellulose material. If and when low temp comes, I'm sure we'll have a polypropylene um, um style for that as well but right now just one filter in it and people say wow man i'm so worried about wet sets and but think about it if you're running a buoy dick test every morning and you're getting a great vacuum right and your tests are coming back good when when you're pulling a vacuum man that the power and the pressure in that one filter is more than enough to get that hot steam in pulled in and then to export it back out so you know, one filter works beautifully. Also, you know, in terms of reducing errors, if if you've got filters in the bottom, you know, I think everybody who has that has probably had a had a scenario in the OR where they've opened the case, took the basket out and looked at, and oh, somebody forgot to put a filter in the bottom, and now my back table's contaminated. We've got to start over, right? So there's no filter in the bottom. So in terms of reducing errors, well, that doesn't happen a lot. It's not fun when it does happen. So that can help a lot as well. So, Okay, that's great. So now talk to me about latches and locks, because sometimes if that's not working really well, that can be a source of frustration for techs that are trying to put up, you know, trays to be sterilized. 
It sure can. And, and because it's, it's a moving part, probably the only moving part on a container, it's also one that, that's, you know, can, can break down. So, because it's a mechanical piece. So we've got this sort of this integrated handle on the lid. It's sort of a single motion latch and makes it very easy. It's a little different than what we have now. What we have now in our legacy container also is a single latch. The one on the icon system also single latch, but it allows for that lifting of the lid and that aseptic presentation. So really critical. The lock also has changed a little bit. Locks, you, you know, now hang on the side, right? The big orange locks or the blue locks, they'll hang on the side. And now we've got a lock that integrates into the, the lid. So if you're standing above it, you don't have to look to the side to see if it's on. You can see that a lock is there. It's very small. It's about the size of the tip of your finger, your small finger. And it latches in there. And when you open it, it breaks that lock and you can't reuse it. But the other thing is, Justin, that's really cool, is it doesn't go flying across the room. It stays in there so that somebody has to physically take it out so that that flying lock piece doesn't hit into the sterile field. So kind of a cool little design. Again, probably doesn't happen in the real, real world very often. But if it does, again, not fun. So that lock design is, is, is pretty neat. So. One of the other things I just wanted to touch on before we jump is, is I know you and I had talked about it, was the colored face plates. So in the past, Esculap had colored lids. The only problem is we had, I think, six of them. There's many, many more services than six, right? So the colored lids became, you know, a little bit obsolete and not as useful as some hospitals or surgery centers would like. So now we've got colored, interchangeable colored face plates. Got dozen colors. And so now you can go through, change the face plate by service and also add tags if you want to say, okay, this is major set, minor set, plastic set, that kind of thing. So there's a way to easily identify that container to the service that you want it to go to. And the colored face plates is the way to do it. Yeah. I love the color coding. And, you know, I think everybody out there, you know, just to have that easy, quick identification, if they want to use that color coding, that's wonderful. And the other thing that we talked about early on was the partnership and what's required of, you know, vendor and supplier partners these days to just kind of keep healthcare rolling forward. And you really do have to offer a great deal of support. And so moving to either, you know, a container system for the first time or making a transition, I mean, obviously that has an impact on the day to day. And I think this is something that you and I talked about that really stands out as the kind of support that the Asculap sales team can provide through that process. Because honestly, there's just nobody in the department that somebody can assign to really manage a conversion anymore. They're not there. So you almost have to do it for them. And it's a lot. I mean, containers are, are one of those sort of capital oriented projects. And, you know, it's, it's not for the faint of heart, you know, I mean, because it takes a lot and it takes some understanding. I think. The nice thing is, is that with Esculap, we're very solution oriented. We would like to understand customers' challenges, what can make it better, and, and can we provide some expertise that gets the customer to where they need to be. Now, some of the things that we'll do around containers, we'll do a container sizing analysis. So we'll look through and, and we'll go through, do you want to do, you know, are you trying to get all your blue wrap out? Are you trying to do vendor trays? Are you trying to just standardize that kind of thing? So we'll do an analysis and it'll identify the sizing. That's really the, the first thing that you've got to do. Plus what it does is it lays down a roadmap. Not everybody has that kind of capital dollar to spend right away, but if you could have a sizing analysis and you could pick, okay, I'm going to do my 80, 20 rule. I'm going to pick my 20, top turners, right? The ones that we blow through major, minor, ortho basic, those kinds of sets. Those will have the biggest impact, not just on my staff, but on the financials. So those what I'm going after first. So there's ways to use that sizing analysis that allows hospitals to either do it all at once or do it strategically as they go along. And that's a critical piece, but it's always the first piece. 
Yeah, the phases piece. And it's a new product, right? So people need to be trained on how to use it. I mean, you just talked about like the locking design, which I think is really cool. And and it just, it's very visible, right? You don't have to, to, to move and look on the side, but all of these things require some education. You know, do you provide in-servicing and, and, and education around? Yeah, the we absolutely do. And, and you know, as, as sort of the second piece after after we do the sizing is is let's say the project's going forward we 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 do a staging we we typically will set things up to be a ship complete so that when when the pallets of containers arrive everything is in there right we're not waiting six weeks on backwards just that kind of stuff everything arrives our teams always come in and unpack projects if you're ordering two or three containers most spds can unpack those themselves but if they've got four or five pallets out there We'll come in and get those things unpacked, get them set up, staged, ready to go on to the dirty side. And then, as you mentioned, the education piece, because once they come to the clean side, what do I do with them, right? How do we deal with this? Because this is different. And so we like the education piece. There's two types of educations that we'll, we'll offer for, for projects. One of them is sort of a let's get acquainted with the product in service, right? So we'll educate in service on, okay, here's the container. Here's how it works. Here's what it means at your workbench. Here's how you go get it. Here's what, you know, here are the parameters. Here's the IFU, just those nuts and bolts of making that container work on a daily basis and not just an SPD. The OR needs to see it, right? They need to understand, okay, this looks different. What does that mean? Do I inspect filters the same, you know, what are the parameters for, for aseptic presentation? So we need to talk to the operating room as well. Do you have a story um, that you can kind of tell about a customer interaction, about implementation and how you navigated that successfully? Oh, we do. Yeah. Justin, I've been doing this a long time. We've got a lot of stories. So, um, uh, you know, pre-pandemic, I think, as we talked prior to this, this meeting, I was thinking in the pre-pandemic, we had a mid-sized community hospital, right? And they had a mix of containers and three different container systems in there, and they were probably 60% blue wrap. So the SPD manager and the periop director at the time both felt they were really inefficient, right? I mean, I got techs that are looking for different filters for different containers. We also are bogged down because we're, you know, we're wrapping major trays in, in, in blue wrap. You know, why aren't those in containers, that kind of thing. So we came through and, and we did their sizing and it had percolated up to director of nursing and then it went to the COO. So somebody who was really focused on operations within the hospital latched onto it and, and Budget became available to do the project. So they didn't do it in phases. They went after it in, you know, in one big bite. And the advantage for them in, in SPD was even pre-pandemic, they were short-staffed. They were seeing increasing caseloads. So they were really challenged to get things through consistently and right every time. So we did the sizing we did the budget justification. We did an ROI, a little ROI analysis, and then the implementation came. I, and I think they had 20 pallets of containers show up. So we brought a team in. I think we had six or so and took a couple of days, got everything unpacked, got everything, all the garbage out to the dumpster, all the cardboard packed up, and we, we helped them phase the containers from the dirty side to the clean side. And at that point, okay, how do we stage this now? to take your existing fleet of sets and get them into the container. Yeah, that's a big workload, right? Like that's a big part of the process. Probably the biggest. It is. And you don't you don't do that in a couple of days and you do don't do it over a week. I mean, you could try to do it over a weekend, but you're going you're going to crush some people, right? It's hard. So for us it was and and in partnership with them, they luckily their SPD had some room, right? So we had some racks, we staged some things so when Sets came through, they went and pulled them, they tagged them, and the new container went in. And then they had a place to put the old stuff so that it could go to um, go to recycling. So it was a nice process. So much easier when you can just integrate it into the normal operation, right? And so that makes it seamless. Yeah, I can see where that's so huge. But somebody's going to have the time to stage it 
and assist with, you know, okay, this is the right container for this tray, right? And getting that all set up. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's where our team is really good. We've, we've, we do this thing all the time. There are some sets that, that we'll add if, when we're doing the sizing analysis, we'll have to break them open because you look at them, well, I don't know if this is going to fit. I'm not even sure what's in this set, you know? So you look at it and you break it open and, and you look at it and you make sure you get the right sizing. But for the most part, I would say most of the sets we can look at, we don't have to tear them down to do the sizing analysis. So we're not putting a major burden on, on reprocessing sets that we had to take apart just to figure out what, what container they go in. We're really good at, at nailing that down. All right, last thing, and we're getting close to the end here, but the financial services that you offer, I think with a capital purchase like this, especially like in the example you just gave where it's just all in rather than a phased you know, project implementation, what kind of financial services are available? Because budgets are getting tight and capital dollars are you know, even harder to come by than they ever have been. Justin, these days, nobody has a budget and then capital dollars are on, on freeze, right? So it's, but if you, I, we have found and we are finding that if we can, if we can do a good justification, not just for the dollars, but efficiencies, that dollars become available because SPD is now looked at as, as a, as an integral business component within the hospital. So there, there is hope for, for dollars and, so what can we do? There's two avenues. One we call a wrap to rigid. So let's say everybody is, let's say somebody's got a, a high volume of wrap sets and they want to containerize. The wrap to rigid program would allow us to bring in all the containers needed to move the wrap out and then pay it off over X amount of time. Maybe it's 12 months. And the idea there is, let's say they're spending a certain amount on wrap every month. They're just reallocating those dollars part of the process. Yeah. That's so Trade smart. those operational dollars to pay for the containers over 12 months. So that's the wrap to rigid program. And one that's that, that we've done, gosh, we've done that 20 years and it's been very successful over the years. We also have leasing or, or what we call fleet management within Esculap. So if somebody says, look, you know, we want to, we want to do this and we know that if we do it little by little, We'll never get there, right? So we want to do it either in very big chunks or we want to do it all at once. Sometimes that dollar buyout lease, we can do that within a very short period of time, sometimes 12 months, sometimes it's 24. We also have a program called fleet management, which allows us to bring in the containers for the hospital and they pay a monthly fee. And for that fee, the, the hospital they basically will never own those containers. We'll own them still, but but they will never have to repair them. We'll repair them. If they need new ones, we bring those in. So it's it's a way to get into containers, not on a capital budget, but realizing that, you know, somebody's going to take care of my repairs and my replacements for for years to come. So and yeah, it's a cost per procedure, just like the it other is, modalities. Yes. That's really yeah. interesting. So that's all super flexible. And I think as we've gone through this conversation, we've talked about education, we've talked about support, we've talked about operational efficiencies, and you gave a really nice example of that conversion. So I do want to encourage everybody that if they want more information, they can reach out to their local rep because they will have resources and that education for you. If you kind of want to talk to somebody generally, there's a customer service team that can be reached at 800-282-9000. Also visit the website, askulapusa.com. And Askulap can be found on all the various platforms in social media, especially LinkedIn. So Mike, you did an excellent job with the interview, and I'm really excited about this Icon container system. There's some really cool features that we reviewed today, and you know, as you continue to explore the low temp and everything else, maybe we'll do an update and kind of let everybody know. Um, Boy, wouldn't that be fun? Yeah, let's let let's put that on the on the calendar when that when and if that happens, Justin. Again, you know, I'm not sure when, but hopefully soon. That would be good. Excellent. Well, thanks for joining me today, Mike. Justin, thank you so much. And, and to your audience, thanks for having me. And, and please reach out if, if we can help. We're, we're happy to be partners with, with our valued customers.
That was Mike Strand, Regional Sales Director, Northwest Healthcare Solutions for Asculab, talking about the new Icon sterilization container and the whole conversation around the sophistication and professionalism and SPD, but also the lack of workforce requiring operational efficiencies is just a constant theme. I can't get away from it. And so I love the way that Asculap supports a conversion like this because definitely moving from either wrap or another container system to the icon is going to take a little bit of a lift. So the support in terms of managing the project and providing the education and the in-servicing from the team is so critical. So as a reminder, you can reach out to your local rep. They have all those resources and education. They have lots of information around the financial services. If the capital budgets are not available, you can also call the customer service team 800-282-9000. Visit the website askulapusa.com and certainly follow them on all the various social media platforms, especially LinkedIn. That's going to do it for this vendor spotlight. But as a reminder, you can help support Beyond Clean by subscribing on Apple, Amazon, or Google Podcast. We're also available on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or simply search for Beyond Clean on your favorite podcast application. We also have bonus content for certain episodes, but to access it, you have to download our smartphone app for either iPhone and Android. And while you're there downloading, we'd appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to the show. If you have any topics that you'd like us to cover on a future episode, or maybe you have a recommendation for a guest, send an email to info at beyondclean.net. Thank you for listening to this vendor spotlight on Beyond Clean.